We ended last time by talking about the sense in which Schumpeter's competitive democracy is minimalist. And I said that it is an important sense minimalist. It's linked to this idea of the competitive struggle for power and the, the notion that um, turfing the rascals out is, is um, the sine qua non of democratic politics. Um, there's one respect in which even if this is a middle, minimal requirement, it's nonetheless a very substantial minimal requirement. So the, the basic issue was, um, is this conception of democracy too minimalist? Um, it is minimalist in, in an important sense in that it reduces democracy to this competitive struggle for the people's vote. I said it's, there's one restraint in which it clearly is not minimalist, which is that if, if one's expectation is, as Huntington and others would come to argue later, that we can't call a democracy, a country a democracy until there have been two turnovers of, overs of power. That means the US was not a democracy until 1840. Um, Japan has only recently become a democracy. Countries like South Africa are not yet democracies, or we can't, at least we can't say they are, uh, because we don't know what would happen uh, if the ANC lost an election. So minimal is not negligible. And I think that uh, for those who complain that Sch Schumpeterian democracy is too minimalist, try living in a country that doesn't have it. Uh, and you will find that, uh, that, it, that minimal is indeed not negligible. Still, you might say that raises the question of what it is that we can reasonably expect from democracy, because most people typically expect more from democracy than just the turnover of government. And if we, if we go back to the large themes of this course, um, remember that when I introduced the subject of democracy and we looked at Plato and Tocqueville's critiques of it, um, we, we really were left wondering, well, why, why would anyone think that if, if protecting individual rights and basing politics on scientific principles of truth is the, is the answer, why would we want, it, it, why would we want to uh, pursue democracy as the goal to, to achieving that answer? Um, but if you now take a, a step back and ask, well, compared to what, democracy starts to look pretty good because what we have seen in the literature on democracy is that um, no other political system does a better job of protecting individual rights. We saw that uh, Madison was greatly concerned with the separation of power and the creation of um, we might call Republican constraints on democracy. But the literature from the 20th century has established, principally by Bob Dahl, but also from many others, that if you look at, if, if you look at the addition of con judicial review, this is not something that lawyers like to hear, but if you look at the addition of judicial review to democratic politics, it doesn't really add anything. That is to say, the way in which empirically rights are best protected is by creating Schumpeterian democracy. Adding judicial review on top of that doesn't seem to make any difference as far as preserving individual rights is concerned. Uh, the big thing is to get and keep democracy, not to get and keep judicial review. And uh, I think that is reflected in the fact that uh, separation of powers at the end of the day is words upon a parchment, whereas the, the pluralism that guarantees competitive politics is embedded in the society, and that is ultimately the guarantor of freedom under democratic conditions. If we think about the truth coming out in politics, basing po finding a political system that, as Mill would have it, could best track the truth, um, Again, what we, what we find when we ask the question, compared to what, democracy does better than the going alternatives. Uh, you can think of Schumpeterian 
competition as institutionalizing Mill's demand that um, we have to have competition of ideas. Remember how Mill got from freedom to uh, utility through his idea of the truth coming out of competitive argument, not deliberation, not sitting around and contemplating things together, but people having to argue for their views and defend them uh, on the grounds that uh, they can meet the objections of their uh, critics. And so Schumpeterianism is a kind of institutionalization of the, the competitive argumentative ideal uh, that Mill talks about in the long chapter on freedom of speech in On Liberty. And so again, when we say compared to what, um, democracy does better than the going alternatives in preserving the freedom of speech and the competition of ideas that is likely to make the truth come out in the long run. Uh, so despite the fears of Plato and Tocqueville, when we pose the question compared to what, democracy does better than the going alternatives in vindicating these Enlightenment ideals. As Churchill said, democracy is the worst system of government except for the others that have been tried from time to time. Now, you could, you could uh, buy everything I've just said now, but still feel that this is too minimalist a conception of democracy to meet the sort of expectations that people have when they make demands for the creation of democracy in the real world. And I think there's merit to that objection, and these last two lectures are designed to address it to the extent that I think it's possible to address it. If we think about the condition on conditions under which people demand democracy, they're usually conditions under which people have a strong experience of injustice. So those of us who were around in the 1980s would hear um, objections from behind the Iron Curtain uh, to communism. People didn't like communism. And what they demanded was democracy. Or if you go to apartheid South Africa, what you find is, um, again, people find, find themselves appalled by and uh, rejecting of apartheid, but what do they demand? They demand democracy. Now, if in either of those instances, you went to those people who would, who those anti-communists who were demanding democracy in the former Soviet Union, or the anti-apartheid activists who were demanding democracy in South Africa, um, and you said to them, well, Tell us what a perfect democracy would look like in Russia or in South Africa. They wouldn't have been able to tell you. And I think that that's an important observation. It's an important observation because it captures a feature of human nature that we haven't commented on very much, um, although it came to the surface in our discussion of McIntyre. Namely, that human beings are reactive creatures. They shy away from what does not work uh, and then fumble in the darkness in search of something that works better or at least something that fails less badly. The famous economist Amartya Sen, uh, who I mentioned to you briefly, I think, made this point brilliantly in a new book of his called The Idea of Justice. And it expressed some of his frustration with the academic literature on justice, which uh, seems to get caught up in debating questions that are three points to the right of the decimal uh, without moving on the big questions of justice. And Sen said, imagine, imagine that you were sitting in a sauna uh, and the controls for the sauna were outside so you couldn't reach them. Um, and it got hotter and hotter and hotter and you were really, really hot. And you said to the person uh, who had their hand on the controls outside the sauna, turn it down, it's way too hot. And his reply was, well, I'm not going to turn it down until you tell me what the optimal te temperature is. And of course, 
what se Sen's point is, you don't know what the optimal temperature is. What you know is this is much too hot. Um, and so I think Sen's, Sen's little story in a more imaginative way than, than anything I have come up with captures this idea that human beings are reactive creatures and we, we, we say this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, and we're constantly looking for something that does better. And so the fact that anti-communists in the 1980s couldn't describe what a well-functioning uh, post-Soviet democracy would look like, or the fact that uh, anti-apartheid activists in the 1970s and 80s couldn't characterize a democratic South Africa for you in any detail, doesn't detract from the fact that their demands for democracy captured uh, something about what they thought was fundamentally unacceptable about the existing state of affairs. And so um, people demand democracy because they experience injustice and they want justice. And they hope that democracy will deliver it. Now some Schumpeterians, Huntington foremost among them, have said this is really bad. This is really a bad thing because what's going to happen when people experience injustice and demand democracy is they're inevitably, they are inevitably going to be disappointed. Indeed, there was a very interesting poll, I thought, uh, out of South Africa on this very point last year where they found a majority of South African blacks saying things were better under apartheid than now, but then when asked would they rather go back to apartheid, a majority said no. Uh, captures, I think, this tension and this paradoxical uh, expectation that people have of democracy. But the Huntingtonian point was, well, uh, that you wouldn't you would jeopardize democracy if you get people to load too many expectations onto it. The, this, to some extent, is defied in the second half of that poll I just, meant to, I just mentioned to you because even though people say things were better in, in the apartheid years, they still don't want to go back there. Um, but, but I think Huntington might say, well, eventually things are going to change. Eventually, when South African democracy fails to deliver on people's expectations about justice, the regime itself is going to come into jeopardy. If you look at South Africa, uh, just to pursue this example, we've now had four elections since apartheid. Uh, South Africa is one of the most unequal countries in the world, has one of the highest Gini coefficients, yet the top marginal tax rate today is lower than it was at the end of apartheid. There hasn't been land reform, there hasn't been significant redistribution of income or wealth. There's been the creation of a small black millionaire class, but for the vast majority of blacks, they're still uh, as badly off as they were before. And so the Huntingtonian thought is that if people load expectations onto democracy that can't be met, then when those expectations are frustrated, eventually the, the, the problem is going to be that people are going to blame democracy rather than the government of the day and turn on democracy when some uh, populist dictator comes along and promises say, as we've seen in Zimbabwe, uh, promises massive land redistribution uh, at the expense of democracy. And so the modern Schumpeterians have tended to say we should try and disabuse people of their unrealistic expectations of democracy um, so that we don't lose at least the minimal benefits of competitive democracy, which we've already agreed are not negligible. And so that this was presented as a kind of realist, uh, real politic take on uh, democracy, that people shouldn't expect it to, dem to diminish injustice. The problem with 
the Huntingtonian view is that people are not going to change their expectations because some professor of political science tells them to. There are deep-seated reasons why people turn to democracy when they experience injustice and uh, are not going to give up on the appeal to democracy in order to remedy it. Um, and those reasons have to do with, I think, with the, the topic we ended at at the very uh, tail end of, of uh, last Wednesday's lecture, is that democracy is motivated, the impulse for democracy is, comes from the impulse to resist domination. And there's a connection between democracy and fighting injustice because both of those things are connected with resistance to domination. So, if we think that the um, Schumpeterians are, are right to say that democracy is often going to fail to deliver on the project of diminishing injustice, but naive to think that people are therefore going to stop uh, uh, ex creating expectations of democracy, that creates a different kind of agenda. That creates the agenda that I want to talk to you about for the rest of today's lecture and uh, Wednesday's lecture. And that is how can we think about promoting justice by democratic means? Given that people are going to have expectations from democracy, the better course is to try and find institutions that can deliver on those expectations. And I think it's an important reason, not only when we reason about democracy, but also when we reason about justice. Uh, many years ago, when I was teaching this course, uh, before I had written Democratic Justice, and indeed one of the, the events that caused me to write it was a, a, a question from a student in the class. Um, I had gone, I had been teaching roles and I had gone through the principles, the difference principle and all of that and, and I had explained that Rawls was the most influential political philosopher of his generation and that this theory of justice had completely revolutionized uh, modern political philosophy and the student put up their hand and said, Professor Shapiro, now that Rawls' theory has been established, why hasn't the Constitution been changed to include it. And many of the students in the class laughed. And they laughed, why, why, does anyone have a guess? Why do you think people laughed? It, it seemed like a naive question, why though? Why, you know, he said, look, you got the right, an John Rawls got the answer, so our constitution doesn't reflect that answer, why haven't they changed it? Why do you think? And students would have laughed. Yeah. People think there's a disconnect sometimes between political philosophy and actual politics and policy. They think there's a disconnect between political philosophy and actual politics. But why, why is there a disconnect? Um, I mean, these political philosophers are trying to get the right answer. So let's suppose it's true that Rawls got the right answer and Nozick didn't and Dworkin didn't and, and Shapiro didn't. You know, Rawls got the right answer. He solved the problem. Why don't we just implement it? This was, after all, what Bentham thought. You know, when Bentham, Bentham thought he'd figured it all out and he went running around the world with his constitutions and was deeply disappointed when countries wouldn't adopt them. Why do we resist this idea? Yeah, at the back. Can we get the microphone to the back? Because generally we don't think that claims are absolutely true and we maintain that they can be um, proved false in the future, like claims are fallible. Okay, so, so part of it is the fallibilism of the mature enlightenment, that people, people somehow resist the idea that anybody's got it perfectly right in the sense of getting a geometric proof. Anything else? Yeah, over here. Just, just hold a second. We want to record what you say for posterity. <laughs> 
democratic system doesn't change that fast. I mean, part of the nature of the system that we have is that it's slow moving. and uh, that's It's slow moving, yeah. But still, why shouldn't it move? You know, they had these, the student might say, uh, well, yeah, okay, but you know, so they had these ideas in the 18th century. Now Rawls has better ideas. Why should we move to Rawls's ideas? I think there's something that will make people resist. There are many people who might concede that Rawls has a better argument than Nozick or Dworkin or Shapiro or, or any of the other people, Mill, that you've been reading, and still want to say it shouldn't be imposed on the society. That somehow principles of justice have to be democratically legitimated in order for us to be forced to live by them. And so I think whether you start from the justice end uh, we, and you're, you are confronted by this reality that people demand democracy when they experience injustice, or when you start from the democracy end, you realize that um, people are not going to embrace principles of justice unless they can triumph through democratic institutions. Um, you realize that pursuing democracy and justice together is important. After all, as I said to you when I talked to you about Madison, even though they thought they had designed the best constitution that they could agree to at the time, uh, nobody had any illusions that, that this would be acceptable if it had not been adopted by the people of the state of New York. Um, so having the right answer is not enough. You've got to have the right answer, but convince people through democratic mechanisms that you've got the right answer. So democracy and justice have to be pursued together. I said that the animating idea behind um, democracy is the, the appeal of resisting domination. But I think it, the, the procedural um, ground rule is what I'm going to call the principle of affected interest. And, and this was nowhere better articulated than by Nelson Mandela in 1962 in his um, statement to the court before sentencing. Uh, some, a little piece of relevant background that you may not know. You don't have to write this down. I will put it up. I'll put it up on the... Uh, server, a piece of background is that they had been convicted of treason. Um, the ANC had finally suspended, uh, had, had, had finally suspended their peaceful uh, opposition about five years earlier and turned to armed struggle. And then uh, a number of ANC leaders had been arrested and tried and convicted of treason. And their attorneys uh, told them that they were going to get the death sentence, and the only way they could possibly avoid the death sentence was to get up and be contrite and beg to be let off. And, and the young Nelson Mandela said, no, I'm not going to do that, and he stood up and he made this famous speech in which he said, I'm, I'm charged with inciting people to commit an offense by way of protest against the law a law for which neither I or any of my people had any say in preparing. But in weighing up the decision as to the sentence which should be imposed for such an offense, the court must take into account the question of responsibility, whether it is I who is responsible or whether, in fact, a large measure of the responsibility does not lie on the shoulders of the government which promulgated that law knowing that my people, who constitute the majority of the population of this country, were opposed to that law, and knowing further that every legal means of demonstrating that opposition had been closed to them by prior legislation and government administrative action. We played no role in making the laws that affect us, and we have no means of opposing the laws that affect us, is what he was saying. And that's why we turned to the armed struggle. And it's not our, uh, our failing. The, of course, uh, the government was calling them terrorists, of course. Uh, why wouldn't they call them terrorists? But Mandela's position was uh, 
that the principle of affected interest had been violated. This notion that I think is very close to the, the most fundamental procedural idea in democratic theory that people whose interests are affected by a decision presumptively should have some say in making that decision. If you think about the Boston Tea Party, which the current Tea Partiers are trying to piggyback, piggyback on the legitimacy of, it was the same notion, no, right, no, what without representation, no what? Yes, okay. So it's the same idea that, that people who are affected by decisions, if you're going to tax us, we want to be involved in, we want to have representation in the decisions about taxation. And so uh, it's, it's trying to, to capture that idea uh, that I'm talking about when I talk about democratic justice. And I want to describe first a general argument and then some particulars. The first is that this rests on a broad conception of politics. Uh, what do I mean by a broad conception of politics? Well, consider this fact. When we talk about, uh, those of you who have read political philosophy in the history of the tradition will know uh, that for, for most of the great theorists of the past, um, the organization of the political system was only one piece of a theory of politics. Plato, Aristotle, Locke, Mill, uh, all of these thinkers thought that it was important to have a theory of family life, a theory of education, a theory of how the whole society operated. Um, Politics is not just about what goes on in buildings in Washington and in Hartford. Uh, it was a broad conception of politics. Um, and one of the criticisms of much contemporary political theory has been that it ignores um, the, broad, the broad society. So for example, it was a, it was a criticism made of Rawls's theory of justice by feminists that it ignored the structure of the family. Um, Rawls talked about heads of households as the basic um, uh, representative individuals behind the veil of ignorance. And when he was saying that this was part of the basic, his theory was a theory of the basic structure of society, feminist theorists such as Susan Okin uh, now deceased, and others, made the argument, how can you say you're talking about the basic structure of society while ignoring the family? And uh, Rawls eventually conceded the validity, the validity of that criticism and came to say toward the end of his life that had he to do it over, he would have, he would have included the family as part of the basic structure of society. So, if politics is about power relations, then presumably you should think about power relations wherever they occur in social life and not simply power relations as they occur in the political system narrowly defined. And so the spirit of my argument for uh, democratic justice is to, be, to base it on a broad conception of politics rather than a narrow one. Of course, that doesn't mean that every political relationship is a politicized relationship. We might say that the family is an intensely political institution and indeed uh, debates about um, education and debates about abortion and debates about many other su subjects have politicized the family in recent times. But in the 1950s, it was not a politicized institution. It was seen as something beyond politics um, of, no, of no relevance to politics. So what institutions are politicized in that sense, subconscious, uh, consciously conceived of as political, is a separate question from what institutions are in fact political if we define political as involved in the, um, in the reproduction of power relationships in the society. 
So we have a broad conception of politics. And then secondly, we have a semi-contextual argument. And this is, this is to try and take account of what people like McIntyre have argued, that um, what people are willing to accept is largely conditioned by the, the social circumstances into which they are born, the traditions that they find structuring their lives, that uh, we have to take into account the context in which people find themselves. But there's more to life than just the context. That is to say, um, there are inherited traditions and practices, but as we reproduce them into the future, we have choices to make, and we need principles to guide those choices. And so um, the argument of democratic justice is that we do develop general principles of a sort, but they're semi-contextual. That is, they play themselves out differently in different historical circumstances and in different uh, parts of the world. Uh, so you may, for example, have an affirmation of the idea of um, non-domination in family life, but that's going to have to be worked out very differently in, in America in 2010 than it might have been in America in 1950, not to mention in countries that have inherited polygamous systems of traditional marriage. We're going to have to think in context-sensitive ways about how to realize those general principles in the different circumstances. A third point, and I apologize here, I, I did uh, swear off uh, impenetrable jargon at the beginning of this course, and you might think uh, talking about superordinate and subordinate goods is, is a use of uh, not very uh, user-friendly terminology, but let me explain what I mean by this. If we take a broad conception of politics, one of the things that follows from it is that power relations are everywhere. Power infuses everything we do. There's, there are power relations in the family, there are power relations in the workplace, there are power relations in sports teams, there are power relations in classrooms. Power infuses everything. This is, of course, an idea for which the French um, political commentator now deceased uh, by the name of Foucault is famous for pointing out that power is everywhere. But of course, it's as old as the hills. Plato was of, of the same view, that power relations are everywhere. And indeed, the reason Plato affirmed a broad conception of politics was, to his, was because he recognized that power is exercised everywhere in the society. And so, uh, if you, if your theory of politics is really a theory of power relations, it's going to have to track uh, power wherever it goes. So if power relations are ubiquitous and politics is ubiquitous, then it seems like, well, everything is politics. And it's that last phrase that I want to dissent from, that last phrase in Foucault or in Plato that I want to dissent from. Because, in fact, what we really see is not that everything is power, but that power infuses everything, and there's an important difference. Yes, there are power relations in the classroom. Teaching fellow has a certain kind of power over you. I have a certain kind of power over you. Um, but that's not the only thing that goes on in the classroom. Presumably, also, what goes on in the classroom is enlightenment. Uh, not in the big E sense of the enlightenment, but enlightenment in the sense of communicating knowledge to you. In the firm, yes, there are power relations in the firm. Managers have power over workers. Um, shareholders have power over managers, at least in certain circumstances. Of course, there are power relations in firms, but the exercise of power is not the only thing that goes on in firms. Uh, there's the production of goods and services that goes on in, for, in firms, right? Yes, there are power relations in sports teams. 
manage, again, coaches have power over players. Donors, you might say, have power over uh, coaches, even university presidents um, sometimes. So, of course, there are power relations associated with sports teams, but again, sports teams are not just about power relations, they're also about playing sports well. So, you can, as you can, you can get the point from these examples, we could go uh, everywhere uh, through society and see, yes, uh, social relations uh, often involve power, but that's not all they involve. So, to my way of thinking, the superordinate good is the playing excellent sport or, or, or uh, producing goods and services or communicating uh, enlightenment to students. Those are the superordinate goods, or what McIntyre called the internal goods. Um, when he was talking about his practices. Those are the superordinate goods that guide uh, our activities in different walks of life. Um, the subordinate goods have to do with the power relations. And what I want to say is that the goal of a democratic conception of justice should be to democratize the subordinate relations as much as possible while interfering with the superordinate goods as little as possible. You, you, at the end of the day, want the sports team to be able to play the best football it can play, or you want the students to learn as much as they can possibly learn, or you want the firm to produce efficiently, as efficiently as possible, the goods and services that it produces, right? So that, that those are the superordinate goods. However, there, are, there is this fact about power being mixed up in the, in the pursuit of superordinate goods, and democratic justice is about democratizing the power dimensions of human interaction while interfering with the non-power dimensions as little as possible. And the creative challenge is to find ways to do that. And I think that when we're thinking about conditioning the subordinate dimensions democratically, there are really two dimensions of democratic justice that are both present in that famous quote from Nelson Mandela that I read to you a few moments ago. One is the idea of collective self-government. It's the idea that, as the principle of affected interest intimates, Anyone who is affected by a decision should have a presumptive say in the making of that decision. Doesn't necessarily mean everybody has an equal say, we'll get to those issues later, but everybody is presumed to have a say in the making of decisions that affect them. No taxation without representation. It's the idea of collective self-government. If we're going to be affected by decisions, we should have a say in making them. But then, separate from that, and independent of it, is the idea of the legitimacy of opposition. The legitimacy of resisting decisions that you don't like. And I think there are two reasons for this. Forget about the presumption against hierarchy for a minute. I'll get to that shortly. Just focus on the idea of institutionalizing opposition. There are two reasons for that. One I've already alluded to today, which is that we're always fumbling in the dark. We're always resisting things that haven't worked well in the past. We're trying to change things. We might be rebuilding the ship at sea, as, um, as uh, Devlin says, but we are trying to rebuild the ship. We are trying to make things better as we reproduce them into the future. Um, and unless we have the freedom to oppose the existing order, then uh, the possibility of change becomes elusive. But a second and more fundamental reason that we should institutionalize rights of opposition is that you now know from taking this course that there are no perfect decision rules. We saw that if we look, if we just focus on the arm's length types of transactions that characterize um, 
national level politics, politics in buildings in Washington. We, we did end up with a presumption in favor of majority rule when we, when we worked our way through um, the, the difficulties with Buchanan and Tulloch and Brian Barry and, and Ray and all of that. Um, that, that other things being equal, you protect yourself best with majority rule, um, but it's not a perfect decision rule. You know from Condorcet and Kenneth Arrow that there is no perfect way to aggregate preferences into a social welfare function. So if there's no perfect decision rule, one of the things that follows from that is that whatever the decision rule, whatever the result, there are going to be people who object to it and who object to it legitimately. People who are going to feel that their interests have not been taken adequately into account. And so opposition is important for that reason, to give people the possibility of trying to get things changed. Very important for the stability of democracy as well, because if you don't create avenues for loyal opposition over time, you're more likely to get disloyal opposition. If people feel there's no possibility of change, they might as well reach for their guns. So um, there are two dimensions of, de of democratic justice for that reason. There's collective self-government and then this idea of institutionalizing opposition. In practice, I suggest that one of the most important ways in which we institutionalize opposition is with a presumption against hierarchy. If you think of the examples I just gave you, sports teams, classes, um, firms, um, you could think of many others, armies, um, uh, families, they're all hierarchical to a very considerable extent. All those social forms are, are hierarchical. And um, often the hierarchy is, is essential to the realization of the superordinate good in question. So it's not the case that hierarchies are necessarily bad, but it's when hierarchies atrophy into systems of domination that they become bad. Power corrupts, and the, the problem is to prevent those who are higher up in hierarchies from um, taking advantage of their hierarchical, hierarchical authority in order to um, dominate others. And so when we confront hierarchical social arrangements, there are, a lot, there are a number of questions that we can ask, what I'm calling here. We can interrogate hierarchies. We can ask, is a hierarchy inevitable? Well, the hierarchy of a parent over a child is inevitable, but the hierarchy in, say, in the 1950s of a hundred, husband over a wife was not inevitable. If the hierarchy is inevitable, we're going to have to think about it in one way. If it's not inevitable, we're going to think about it in a different way. Is the, the degree of hierarchy appropriate? Children must be subordinated to their parents, but maybe they don't have to be subordinated for 18 years. We have the arguments of the children's rights movement that wanted to um, treat children as as miniature adults almost from infanthood. So we, we have to think about, is the hierarchy appropriate? Whose interests does the hierarchy serve? Is it really in the interests of the production of the superordinate good? Think of a boss who has hierarchical authority over a secretary and says to the secretary at some point, uh, Unless you are willing to go to bed with me, you're, go you're not going to get a promotion. Then the hierarchical authority has atrophied into a system of domination because the, the efficiencies that would be gained from the boss having authority over his secretary have been perverted into uh, something that operates in the interests of the boss, perhaps, um, but not uh, it, it doesn't serve 
the hierarchy as it was created. How fluid is a hierarchy? Is it self-liquidating? If, if you think of the situation where a child becomes a parent, a child becomes an adult, that's a self-liquidating hierarchy. Whereas if we go back to the 19th century and the father turned his daughter over to her husband, uh, that would be a non-self-liquidating hierarchy. Is there vertical mobility within the hierarchy? Think of the debates in the Catholic Church about whether a woman can become a priest. Um, there does seem there's not a lot of vertical mobility within that hierarchy. Is the hierarchy symmetrical? We think of the defense of polygamy, but most societies that have polygamy allow a man to have many, a husband to have many wives, but not a wife to have many husbands. Asymmetrical hierarchies are more suspect than symmetrical ones. What are the opportunities for exit? Can people leave hierarchical social situations? You think about polygamy in uh, South Africa, it's essentially elective. People can choose polygamous arrangements, but they don't have to. Whereas in some societies, in fundamentalist cultures, polygamous marriage is enshrined in the legal system. Other things being equal, um, hierarchical systems are more suspect when the costs of exit are high for the people at the bottom. How insular is the hierarchy? For instance, we look at the Amish, it's a withdrawing sect. Uh, they don't want to restructure the rest of the social order. So that is presumptively less suspect than a fundamentalist group that does want to restructure the social order. So there, there are all of these questions one can ask about hierarchical social relationships. You have to ask them in a context-sensitive fashion, and then you can get some answers that tell you what we should be trying to pursue in the name of democratic justice. And I will pick up with some of those answers on Wednesday.